What up, Mosaic? Hey, we feeling good today? Excited to be here with you, all right? Yep. Hey, uh, I just spent four weeks away on my annual study break, and I had a great time, but I'm not going to lie, I missed you a little bit. Not like too much, but you know, like a little bit. Uh, my wife and I, Stephanie, we really wanted to say to our staff and to our overseers, thank you for enabling us to have this time of like refreshing and recentering and refueling for the next year of ministry. And I do want to say to just the church at large, we're so grateful and honored by you and how receptive you were to us getting this time away. Um, last week when I was out and about talking to people uh, here on Sunday, even though I wasn't preaching, I had a lot of people say, man, you look rested. And I like that because it's so much better than the alternative when they say, you look tired. <laughs> you ever heard people say that? Like, you look tired. It's like, well, I wasn't going to smack you, but now I am. <laughs> But we had, we had a great study break. We started with a staycation where I took our kids to Camden Yards and watched the nose game. And you could tell these two are really into it. <laughs> then we took our family to a movie theater for the very first time and we saw Inside Out 2. If you're thinking you should go to counseling, just go see the movie. And then you'll know you need counseling. And it's great. Uh, then we did a vacation at a lake house, which was incredible. We chased fireflies with the kids and did nothing. And enjoyed a cigar or two and it was wonderful and then we uh the family stayed home and I got away for like a solitude time where I just was quiet and read and studied and prayed about where God wanted to take us over the next year it's just me myself and my golf clubs and it was wonderful really good time uh and then uh it was just a really refreshing time back reassimilating connect with the team and kind of talking about what God's been up to here and when I got back is when I learned that while I was away y'all were getting after it because in the four weeks I was gone, we had 115 first-time guests in the middle of summer, which is great. Yes, you should be excited about that. And then, even more importantly, in four weeks, 20 people gave their lives to Jesus and got baptized. Like, it's crazy. Like, we're living the dream right now. Like, this happened in the summer. It's awesome. And, and coming back from study break, I just felt so happy, like genuinely happy to live in a community that's not based on the personality or performance or platform of a few people, but on the collective impact of all of us doing our part to share what God is doing in our lives, to invite people into it, to live radically vulnerable lives of authenticity, and then pointing to the radical love of God that is made available to us through Jesus Christ. So um, it is such a treat to be a pastor who steps away and the church doesn't tread water, it takes new ground. And that's what you guys did this summer uh, and it really is a joy to be a part of it. I am really excited today to launch, in, launch us into a new series, though, um, and get us started uh, with the next couple weeks as we gear up for the rest of the summer and then the rest of the fall. So I want to begin by telling you about one of the most sobering mini-documentaries I've seen in several years. It's about the 400,000 soldiers who, in the 1950s and 60s, participated in over 1,000 nuclear bomb tests in the Pacific and in some parts of the continental United States. These were soldiers that were part of the atomic weapons testing but were sworn to secrecy. They had to carry with them for decades like the weight and like the trauma and drama of what they had experienced in these secret tests. Um, in 1994, though, President Clinton declassified the results of these tests, but he un unveiled that declassification the same week as the O.J. Simpson trial, <laughs> so nobody knew it, nobody paid attention, and none of the soldiers realized that they were allowed to talk about this. So these men went for decades holding close to them the terrifying things they had seen. But in a mini-documentary put out by The Atlantic a few years ago, we got to hear from these guys for the first time what it was like to witness the terrifying power of atomic weapons for the first time. And these men were called the Atomic Soldiers. Now, I think I'm a good communicator, but nothing I could say or do could capture what it's like to watch these men and hear these men the first time. So I want to show you some clips that were most memorable to me as they shared what it was like to be an Atomic Soldier. Watch this. Starting to hear sounds. <laughs> I can feel the earth shaking. I don't think I want to go there. It, it's affected me. I'd like to think it hasn't affected me. I like to think I'm, I can tough it out and everything's okay. It has affected me. I will admit to it. Um, you just saw a little bit of it now. Um, I can't watch the bomb. Oh. 
Hood was the biggest, uh, kill it down bomb uh, blown up within the continental United States. <clears throat> it was completely daylight at midnight, brighter than the brightest day you ever saw. I cannot begin to describe the light that came into my eye. I was totally blinded. When I came out of the blindness, I saw my hands, and by this time, I actually saw the blood vessels and, and my bones in my arm, because as I came across like this, it actually was totally x-rayed. That's how bright the light was, to go from through the back of your head, through your eyes, and into your fingers. You're seeing your bones in your hands. The light faded. And it's like streaks of lightning from ground, from the ground to the sky, about every two feet around you. And then that faded, and it was like giant fireballs in front of your eyes. There was extreme heat, extreme heat. There was pig. There was people screaming, uh, and and running. And there was panic. There was panic, and people screaming because of the heat. Everybody started yelling, and, and some people calling out for their mothers, and uh, some of the trenches collapsed. I don't know. It's like I had lost it, and uh, I don't know why, because um, I'm losing it right now. The whole clump of ground, 10 yards this way, 15 yards this way, 10 yards back over here, a few guys were having a little trouble. They were throwing up. It was normal thing, I guess. So obviously that's very heavy, but it's powerful because it captures what happens within us when we are struck by a power greater than ourselves. I mean, just look at their faces. I mean, these are men who have been marked for a lifetime, really, by just a few moments with arguably the most terrifying thing we've ever created as people. Now, here's what I want us to consider as we step into the series today. Let's just say, hypothetically, you believe that there's a God. I know I can't assume that because we're a church for people who don't go to church and people across a varying spectrum of faith journeys are here checking us out for the first time that you don't know what you think about Jesus, but you showed up. So I can't assume you buy into anything the Bible says. But for our illustration here, let's just say you agree there is a God. And if you agree there's a God, then that also means you agree that he had to create all things, all things stem from him. And if you created all things, here's what I want you to consider. If this is what happens when we encounter the most powerful thing created by man, what will happen when we encounter the one who created mankind itself? Like the atomic bomb was said to possess the power of the sun, and we made that bomb, but God made the sun. And these men display what happens when we get scared by what we can do. So the question again is what happens to us when we encounter what God can do? It's heavy. One pastor famously said, the sun will burn your eyes out from 92 million miles away. Why do we think we can casually stroll into the presence of its creator? What a topic to come back from study break, right? <laughs> <laughs> Today, we're starting a three-week series called No Fear. And we're doing it for a couple of reasons. One is intellectual, uh, one is cultural and historical, and one is spiritual. From a historical cultural standpoint, we're doing this series because we all have a lot of baggage when it comes to this idea of like having a fear of God. And I think it comes from televangelists and it comes from experiences we had as kids or maybe harsh voices that we hear on social media. But we all tend to be allergic to like this kind of harsh fear-mongering rhetoric. And because we carry this with us culturally, we tend to uh, brush aside what is one of the most foundational aspects of God's nature that we read in the Bible, that he is to be feared. So that's a cultural thing we gotta deal with. From an intellectual standpoint, uh, there's a gap that exists for us because the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord as a good thing, but so rarely do we ever feel like fear is a good thing, so we just can't rectify those two and we struggle to figure that out. And then lastly, from a, steer, a spiritual standpoint, we get a problem when we settle for like a misinterpreted or reinterpreted view of what a fear of God is. Because if we don't confront our history and cultivate an accurate vision of what the Bible is talking about when it refers to this idea of a fear of God, what we'll do instead is we'll have this like diluted, diminished, maybe counterfeit version of God that makes us feel good for a moment but doesn't produce any spiritual power because it's not rooted in truth. 
And I'd argue it's why in both churches and culture right now, we've subconsciously molded God in his character to be more palatable to us, and then it produces a flippant and somewhat irreverent kind of posture towards him, which again can fill a room of people, but won't actually produce power. I'd argue this is what's been happening for the last couple decades. Um, The Barna Group reported in 2021 that 60% of people who grow up in church lose their faith within the first decade of their young adult life. And and again, it's because we grow up with this flippant, irreverent view of God. We don't really understand who he is or what he claims to be in the Bible. We make him palatable to us, and then, of course, we don't really feel bad when we decide to walk away. I mean, without having a healthy, holy understanding of the fear of God, it's gonna become easy for you to fall into what I'd call progressive theology that twists the Bible to match our wants and our desires. Without a healthy, holy fear of God, it's easy to fall for political fanaticism that makes God an accessory to your ideology instead of the source of your worldview. Like the fear of the Lord is found all over the Bible. It's a huge principle in the biblical story, but we so rarely think it's good, we can't fathom how it's for our good, and so what do we do? Sweep it under the rug. Skip over those parts of the Bible. Don't really worry about it because God is love and everything will be fine. So, in this series, I wanna give Jesus followers specifically a vision and a vernacular about what the holy fear of God is according to the Bible and why it matters to you. If you're someone who doesn't follow Jesus, I wanna present in this series an intelligent, articulate, and intentionally intimidating picture of who God is according to scriptures so that at the very least you can understand the height of his power which then also reveals the might of his love, okay? And in doing so, today we're gonna figure out what does the Bible actually say about fear of God? What does it mean for us and what's it got to do with us as we try to live our lives well in 2024? A good place to begin is in the book of Proverbs. It's known as the wisdom book of scripture. It's written by this guy named Solomon who's heralded as one of the wisest people who ever lived. It's a book that's a letter written to his son about how to live well in light of God's truth. And here's how the whole book begins. Solomon says, these are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. So it's a very important book written to his most important person, like the guy who would take over his kingdom. So clearly we should give extra attention to what he hits on next. And after the first six verses, which are essentially a preface to this chapter, the um, preface to the whole book, the first thing he says as a piece of advice is this. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So in his thesis paper on living well, he says there's no such thing as being smart if you don't possess a fear of God. And for the next 31 chapters, he references and teaches on the fear of the Lord 14 times. In chapter 22, he says true humility and fear of the Lord lead to riches, honor, and a long life. Next chapter, he says don't envy sinners, but always continue to fear the Lord. And my personal favorite is in chapter 19. He says, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and then one rests content, untouched by trouble. So not only is it the root of all wisdom, but it leads to the peace and the rest that you and I long for. The Bible is unapologetic in its call that we should have a fear of God. It appears over 100 times in the Old Testament alone. There's 36 unique commands about the fear of God in the first five books of the Bible known as the Jewish Torah. And the fear of God is the common behavior found by every biblical hero who ends up face to face with the Lord. In Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sin and God is in the garden, Adam and Eve are terrified, is what the scripture says. In Genesis 28, Jacob meets with God in a dream and he's terrified. Exodus 3, God appears to Moses through the burning bush. He's so scared, he rips his shoes off and falls down on the ground. In John 9, in the New Testament, Peter, James, and John are with Jesus as Jesus goes and spends time with his heavenly father up on the mountain and those three men cower in fear because of what they experience. Like this idea of having a healthy fear of God is all over the Bible, we can't escape it, but again, our cultural and emotional baggage makes it so that we just kind of run away. When you read the Bible and you see this phrase and you see something repeated this often, you cannot overlook it. The fear of God is this huge theme. But what happens often is people will take this phrase and twist it to mean something else. They make it sound like the fear of God really just means being in awe of God or having respect of God. 
And that's nice, but it's always interesting to me because it says fear. It doesn't say awe. It doesn't say respect. Like, when you look up the passages I just referenced of people who were facing the fear of God, there are Hebrew words for awe and Hebrew words for reverence and Hebrew words for respect. Those don't appear in those passages. The Hebrew word fear appears. Like when you think of Adam and Eve, that reference I said of Genesis 3, when they're in the garden after they sinned and they're afraid, they hide naked, look at this. It says in Genesis 3, Adam says to the Lord, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Now there's people who say that fear just means awe and respect. If that's true, then we could replace this word with awe and respect and it would make sense. Let's try it. I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was in awe because I was naked. Doesn't make sense, you get what I'm saying? It doesn't say, I was in such reverence of you because I was naked. No, he was naked and so he hid because he was scared, okay? It doesn't make sense for Adam to hide because he respected God. This doesn't hold up. In other examples throughout the Bible, when people experience the fear of God and reverence uh, of God, um, reverence and awe are sometimes part of what it means to be scared, but primarily the fear of God means you're scared. You're in awe of the Grand Canyon. You don't bow down before it and freak out when you're there. Fear is something different. And awe and reverence can certainly be ingredients in this thing called the fear of God, but it would be counterfeit to just say, oh, just have a big view of God, and that's what it means. Like, I wanna wanna help you see, when you read Bible interpreters that say the opposite of what the Bible says, put up a red flag and stop reading. Just read what it says, and we're gonna break down what it means for you today, but there's something uncomfortable about the reality that awe and reverence are not actually the biblical definition of fear. So to counteract what I'd call the disinformation campaign that's taken place on this word, I wanna ask you to buckle up and hold on for three minutes as I dive into the linguistic history of Hebrew and Greek so we can figure out what the heck is going on when it says fear of God. I'm not gonna ask your permission, I'm just gonna do it, okay? (laughs) The Bible was written in two languages, Hebrew and Greek. Old Testament is Hebrew, New Testament is Greek. And both of these languages describe and define things differently. Ancient Hebrew was a language that described things based on how things were used and how they impacted things. Ancient Greek was more practical and linear and like Western in origin. It just says what it is and what it looks like, which is kind of comfortable for us in America. So let's use a pencil for example. If you were trying to define and describe a pencil, the ancient Greeks would say it's a writing device that is yellow and more or less four inches long. That's what it looks like, that's what it is, that's what you see, that's how the ancient Greek would describe it. But the ancient Hebrew defined things based on how it got used. So the ancient Hebrew definition would be, it puts marks on paper. See the difference? They're different, but they both do a really good job of helping you have a holistic vision of what something is. Now, Greek describes things in terms of appearance, Hebrew describes things in terms of function. So let's think about the Hebrew, because that's the Old Testament, because that came first. When you read the Hebrew phrase fear or fear of God, knowing this, that means the Hebrew definition is not gonna be what is fear of God as much as what does fear of God do to you? How, does, how do you interact with the fear of God? That's what it's saying. And in the same way scientists can't see black holes but they know it's there because of how things are interacting with it, the Hebrew authors were describing fear not based on like what it looks like or what it is, you can't see it. They're describing it based on what does it look like in a person who lives with this? What happens to the individual when they are experiencing fear? Now, the ancient Hebrew word for fear is this word yirah. This is what it looks like. Doesn't help you, but looks cool. But the letters are actually important because ancient Hebrew began as a pictograph, pictogram language, kind of like hieroglyphics. It began with photos, I'm sorry, pictures that were drawn to capture words. Only later did they start to have script like this. So each Hebrew letter actually began as a picture. So this Hebrew word, Yerah, includes three pictures from the ancient, ancient Hebrew. And those three photos were, show them, an ox, that was the first letter, a head of a person, and then like an arm or a fist. So in the original Hebrew, the rabbi tradition used the image of an ox, a man, and a fist, basically, to describe fear. And it's why the ancient rabbi tradition described fear as a deep inner emotion that makes your stomach churn as if you're in a state of danger, like you were if you're an ancient Hebrew man trying to fight an ox. Like that's the origin of the word fear. Now this might sound silly to you and I because there are never ox-related challenges on Fear Factor. (laughs) This is not the animal we're afraid of, 
but it's 2,000 pounds. It'll kill you if you're trying to fight it. Like for us, we're afraid of snakes and spiders, understandably. We're scared of clowns. We're scared of heights. We're scared of public speaking, some of us. But the Hebrew definition of fear in the Old Testament is a description of what happens to you and in you when you are face to face with a legitimate reason to feel in danger. Now again, it's hard for us to wrestle with this, you know, an ox isn't exactly what comes to mind, but there is a more modern visual of something that happened a couple years ago that I can show you that describes what the Old Testament is trying to display through this uh, ancient language. Watch this. Holy <laughs> No, go away. Go away. No. No! Yep. That's the appropriate response. <laughs> Have you seen this before? It's a guy who went hiking a couple years ago, and he comes across a mountain lion and her cubs, and he knows if he turns his back, she'll kill him. So he has to walk backwards slowly while it stalks him for six straight minutes before it leaves. If you want to have a nightmare uh, YouTube session, just go watch that before going to sleep. But this feeling that you got secondhand through the screen is the deep inner churning of the gut that the Old Testament writers were trying to capture when they put the word yura in the Old Testament. Like, it, it, that feeling of fear is what you felt when that animal is charging you or when you're facing something that you should be in danger of. And, and because of this, it's why Bible scholars describe and define the fear of the Lord as a stomach-churning emotion we experience in relation to the power and potential punishment of God. Understanding what fear actually means and then applying it to God helps us understand with what the, the authors were trying to help us see. That it was having a stomach churning emotion, like we saw fear described as, in relation to the power and potential punishment of God. This could include awe. This could include, this certainly demands your respect. But we have to see the, in the Bible, fear means fear. Now remember, Hebrew describes the function of things and the Greek describes how things look. So what's the New Testament word? That could inform things a little bit more and help us get this. Well, in the New Testament, the ancient Greek language, uh, the word for fear there is the word phobos. It's where we get the English word phobia. And a pure Greek definition of that word means to be so scared you run away. Like, what does it look like to have fear of the Lord, according to the Greek? To be so scared you want to run. So the Old Testament says fear of God is the deep inner gut check in relation to the power and potential punishment of God, and the New Testament says it's so intimidating that you want to run away. So that's what the fear of the Lord is in the New Testament in the ancient languages. Now, I already know some of you are like, this doesn't feel right. We just sang about God's love and forgiveness. You tell me all the time that God's for me, not against me. What gives with all this stuff? I mean, even culturally, people say, God is love. What are we talking about? Which is true, but we've got to understand something. God is love is said two times in the Bible. God is holy is said 50 times in the Bible. And for God to be holy, that means he is above all things, he's set apart, he's perfect, everything is underneath him and everything he does in relation to that creation, he can do because he's holy. And because he is holy, that means he can't be around sin. And guess what you and I have? Sin. Like it says in Romans, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, his holiness, his perfection. And a few chapters later, it says, and the wages of that sin is death. The cost, that's what that word means, the cost of our sin, the penalty for our sin is death. So, the reason fear is an appropriate response to God, the reason it produces this feeling in our gut and our desire to wanna run is because of our sin we live exposed to and destined for the wrath and judgment of God because of his holiness. It's why when you are courageous enough in those quiet moments of life, when you're humble enough to consider the real depths of your mess and the holiness of God, the healthy response is fear. There's good news for us today though. And the good news is, is that the holiness of God and the wrath of God, which is a function of his justice to make things all right because he is fair and true, the, the understanding of his power and his holiness and his wrath is also what elevates his love and his mercy for you. Because while scripture does say that the wages of our sin is death, that we're destined for punishment in, in the face of an almighty, perfect God, despite that reality, Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is the eternal life, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. 
See, the reason the fear of God is the root of all wisdom, the reason the fear of God is not something you have to be afraid of today, the reason it's good news for you is because the fear of God is the doorway through which we understand the depth of our sin and the height of God's love. You can't understand the power of God and the depths he went to save you, and you cannot receive the love of God if you do not understand there's a reason you should be afraid of him. Like a holy, healthy fear of God produces that feeling in your gut and a desire to run, but the good news is because of Jesus, we have a promise that if you turn to him through faith and obedience, while you deserve separation because of Christ, we receive salvation. Like if you were on your own, if there was no Jesus in this equation, you would live out what a lot of you were taught when you were a kid, which is you'd be afraid of God, you should run from God, you should perform for God, there's nothing you'll ever do to be right, it's all a mess in the end, good luck. But because of Jesus, the fear of God's not something we have to be scared of. It's actually an essential aspect of what does it mean to live with God because when you live in the fear of God while receiving the love and mercy of God that's made available through Jesus, you live with the fear that produces humility. You live with a fear that makes you desire holiness and try to grow. And you live with a fear that creates wholeness with God because you know he does not give you what you deserve. He gives you something so much better through his son. See, the narrative of scripture is not that we should have no fear and pretend that everything's fine because God is love. You hear that in culture, but that's not the narrative of scripture. What we see the Bible teach is that we ought to know fear and live constantly within the reality of our situation, that if we were apart from Jesus, we'd be screwed. But because of Christ, we can have confidence that even though God is capable and could be right to squash us, he invites us in to become sons and daughters of himself. Whenever you think uh, about this idea of the fear of God, whenever you come across it in the Bible, I wanna give you an acronym to help you understand what does the Bible say about the fear of God? Here it is, F-E-A-R. To live with the fear of God means, first off, to understand you are fallen. You are a sinner before God. And that doesn't mean that you only do bad things. It means you also just fall short of the life Jesus has for you. You languish. You know, we have intrusive thoughts and anxiety and depression, and and we hurt the people we love most, and then we perform for people we barely know. Like, we're jacked up. We are fallen people. But then, because we're fallen, we're estranged from God. We're separated from God. Our sin creates a gap Uh, between our sin and his perfection. But as you saw earlier, while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So living with the fear of God means knowing you're fallen, knowing you're estranged, but also knowing that you are adored by the creator of the universe. Romans 5, 8, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He initiated connection with you. And so you know who you are, you know what it caused, but you know you're adored by God, and because of that, through faith in Jesus Christ, we can be redeemed. So you are a sinner before God, you are separated from God, but you are sought after by God, and by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you are redeemed and saved through Jesus Christ. Whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, this is what the Bible calls us to remember when we wanna live with a healthy fear of the Lord, all of this, and the beauty of this fear is it is the entire story of the gospel. The entire, when you share the gospel to somebody, when we proclaim the good news of Jesus, it's all captured in the fear of the Lord. And it's because of Jesus that we don't have to be afraid of fear. Honestly, anytime somebody comes to put their faith in Christ and get baptized, whether they say it or not, they're embracing the fear of God. They get in that tub and they say, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord because they know deep down what's coming their way if they don't cling to him, the one who can rescue them. And ultimately, wrestling with this idea and really sitting down with the thought of having a healthy fear of God, it's gonna cause you to do what the Old Testament says fear is. It's gonna cause you to run. See, your option today is to run, whether you like to or not, and it's to run either to God or from God. The fear of God demands that you run away from him or you run to him. That's your choice today. Because when you look at your condition and look at your mess and your lack of holiness, you either will reject what he defines to be holy and good, or you'll realize you fall so short and you'll run into his arms because he invites you through what he did in the sun. See, today, if you want to run from God, I can't really help you other than remind you that there's no such thing as being too far gone with our God. Like, you, you, you may be here for a while, you may want to keep running from God, but you keep showing up, just know there's no such thing as being too far that he draws you in, he invites you back, no matter how far you stray to look back to him. But if you want to run from him today, I can't help you much. 
But if you want to run to him, if you're ready to receive the gift of grace that comes through Jesus Christ, check the baptism box in your connection card. We'll follow up with you this week about what does it look like to live with a healthy fear and walk in freedom. And I know some of you, you've already made that decision, but there's still a major takeaway that we need to have of what does it look like to live with this fear. And so each of these next three weeks, I'm gonna give you a single application uh, that, to cling to that's gonna help us imitate what we saw in the early church, whether you've been walking with Jesus for five days or five decades, because living with a healthy fear of God is part of what makes the church unstoppable. In the book of Acts, it's a historical account of the early church, it says this. It says the church became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. So here's your one application today to help us be a church that becomes stronger as we live in the fear of the Lord. Take sin seriously. Super fun application. (laughs) Take sin seriously. If the cost of our sin was death, and Jesus paid it, if we lived with a healthy fear of God, it means we would be people who realized what it cost God because of our sin, and we would then take our sin more seriously. And here are two questions I'd encourage you to consider, not just today, but even in your time of journaling this week, and if you say, well, I don't journal, do it anyway, because you need time to think about these things. But number one, where have I grown casual about my sin? And listen, if you don't follow Jesus, I wouldn't expect you to want to do this. Just know that this level of depth and walking with God and facing hard things is what Christians are called to do. We don't run from it. The most vulnerable people in your life should be Christians because they don't hide, because they don't have to hide from God. But where have I grown casual about my sin? And then number two, what action steps would I take if I took my sin as seriously as God does because he gave his son for it? There's a good chance nearly all of us have some mold in our lives that we've allowed to grow or simply ignored. Um, We've allowed ourselves to forget about the price that was paid in order for our sin to be forgiven. But if you took sin seriously, what would you confess that you've been hiding? Or what would you cut out that you've been tolerating? Uh, What would you have courage to step into instead of being complacent? Is it the fact that your phone is 24-7 in incognito mode so your wife can never look and see your browser history? Is it the secret spending that you do when no one's looking to soothe yourself instead of being a good steward? Is it the secret spending you do without your spouse knowing that you put on a separate credit card? Is it a secret that you know you need to get off your chest but you don't have the courage to share even when you're with safe people? See, to live with a fear of the Lord means you see sin not just as a mistake that you made once but part of a deeper condition that can only be made right through Christ. It's not just mistakes you make, it's the ways that you contribute to the fracturing and brokenness of our creation. And remember, sin, this isn't about shame. This isn't about, you know, trying to make you feel bad. It's about owning the fact that we fall short of what Jesus desires for us and doing our part where he can make all things new. You know, for some of you, the sin that you need to take seriously is not like an immoral thing that you do as much as just getting out of apathy. Have you grown lazy in your own mental health or in your own physical fitness? Have you gotten away from a goal that God put within you? Have you stopped pursuing him as intently as you did when you first got baptized? Just take a look at how am I missing the mark of what God is calling me into? And how might today be an invitation to step back into that noble struggle to walk with God and let the fear of God lead you to greater freedom. Again, this isn't about shaming. It's not about trying to make your life harder. It's about you looking at your state as it really is and receiving the grace of God and then running hard after him in obedience because he did not save you just for you to stay as you are. We fear God because of what he's capable of. We trust God because of what he's done for us. And we love God because while we were still sinners, he initiated to you and I and gave us something greater than what we deserve. I wanna end by telling you a personal story that's helped me kind of wrestle with this idea of like how is God terrifyingly powerful and all good at the same time? And as I thought about that, you know, Jesus taught us to look at God as a heavenly father. So as I've thought about all this, I've spent a lot of time thinking about my father. And when I think of my dad, many of you know my dad. He goes here, he serves here. Uh, When I think of my dad, there are three sort of themes that stand out to me when I think of my pops. Number one, uh, my dad's good. Like, he's a good dad. 
Like he delighted in us as kids. He was intentional with me. We did months long Bible studies when I was in middle school on integrity and humility. We had to talk over like a four day car ride to baseball park so I, I could ask questions but I never had to look him in the face, you know? Like he was a good dad. Um, my dad championed my mom. He made it clear if the house was on fire, he was saving her first, kids were last. He quizzed us about once a year. He was like, if something happens, who am I rescuing? We're like, mom. Like we just knew it. <laughs> But that's like a good man. He's, my dad's good. The second thing that pops to mind from my dad is he's loving. Like if you've met my dad, he's an affectionate dude. He's emotional. He's a crier. He's a hugger. Um, he was present in our lives. He took an interest in, in what we wanted to do. Nobody uh, believed in me more. Nobody pushed me more. And much to the displeasure of my sisters, nobody bragged about me more than my dad. <laughs> my dad loves me. St- still does. But thirdly, when I think of my dad, uh, he was good. He was loving, and he terrified me. My dad's a big boy, (laughs) and he's loud. And when I was little, I was intimidated by him, like a lot of us are, but there was a moment when I was eight that kind of jarred me into realizing he could destroy me if he ever wanted. This one day, we were heading to church, I think. I was like eight. We were uh, in our driveway. Our yard was like maybe by the end of the TV, and we're loading up in our Ford Windstar. This was in the 90s. And for some reason, I don't know why, I clocked my sister in the face. And before I could blink, I was mid-flight, out of the van, (laughs) flying onto the grass. Like, I felt something grab me here and here, and then I was just, I believe I can fly, like, just all the way out. (laughs) And my dad threw me out of the van like a beanbag at a cornhole competition. (laughs) And it was nothing to him and terrifying to me. And I honestly don't remember anything my dad said and scolded me after, but I remember learning, you do not touch your sisters like that. And two, my dad could end me at any point. Like I remember he taught me, you never lay hands on your sister or on a woman. And then I remember walking away from that moment thinking, oh no. When we wrestle, I thought I kind of had him. And I realized he'd been toying with me. And, And to be clear, my dad was justified in removing me from that situation because he didn't hit me, he didn't abuse me, he disciplined me and removed me from the location I had lost the right to be in because of my conduct. And when I think about that moment, my dad was acting justice for my sister. And he was acting justice for the integrity of his home because he said this behavior will not be tolerated within my domain. So he removed me from that location. And I've thought about that moment whenever I think of my dad for like three decades, that he's good, he's loving, and I should have a healthy fear of him. And what this reminds me, this whole moment with my dad reminds me, love and fear are never mutually exclusive. Like we think, how could God be loving if we're also supposed to be afraid of him? Every great dad is deeply loving and terrifying at the same time. Especially when you step outside his good commands that are there to protect yourself and protect others. And I know many of you didn't have a dad like me. You didn't have an earthly example of the character of your heavenly father. You don't understand how love and fear can exist at the same time. But let this moment be a gift and all the more reason to run after your heavenly father who my dad was just imperfectly imitating. That love and fear can exist at the same time. Let today be a reminder that God is to be feared because of what he's capable of but he can be trusted because of what he's done for you and he can be loved safely because he doesn't give you what you deserve. He gives you so much more. An eternal life, a forever friendship filled with belonging and safety and purpose and identity and hope that comes through faith in Jesus. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So let's be a church that knows fear by taking sin seriously. And as you do that, as you confess, if you cut out things, after you you face things in your life, you will walk in more freedom than you ever did before. And it becomes, and it comes, sorry, because you lived with that fear of God. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful that you um, blessed me with a dad who I could prop up as an example of who you are. And God, I'm grateful that we are a community that the confession of sin is not a dirty word. It's something we strive after all the time. 
But God, I know for me, I could confess deep, dark sin, and then six weeks later, think I never have to do that again, but I still do, and I'm still scared. So God, whatever is causing a churning in our gut now, whether it's how big you are, or how much sin we have, or that thing in our life that's been growing mold in the dark, God, help us see that being scared of what you're capable of doesn't mean you're bad. It actually elevates how good you are to us. And I pray that even in this moment of communion and worship, that the idea that you are good, that you are for us, would hit all the more. Because being afraid of you makes sense. But it also produces freedom because we know we can trust you. So help us do that, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.